Labyrinths is brought to you by Knox Robinson Productions. Please consider becoming a patron. For as little as $5 a month, you can listen to Labyrinths ad-free. Visit patreon.com slash Knox Robinson to learn more. They are watching you, even now. So by now I knew that I was being followed. Through your financial transactions, your GPS, your medical records. It's a little bit like being chased through the woods by a bear. They shape the world you move through. They choose your choices. This was a living nightmare, Amanda. I had no idea like how powerful this group was, if I was in any genuine danger. And those who attempt to reveal their secrets disappear. Feeling lost? Then you're in the right place. I'm Amanda Knox. And I'm Christopher Robinson. And this is is Labyrinths. If you haven't figured it out yet, this episode is about conspiracies. Conspiracies? You mean like when you're accused of using your witch-like feminine wiles to orchestrate satanic murder orgies? Exactly. The temptation to indulge in confirmation bias and seek wild and nefarious answers to questions that likely have boring or chaotic explanations is a particular problem in our current moment. Social media has enabled the spread of misinformation, bolstering the conspiracy mindset. No matter what you believe, it's now incredibly easy to find someone out there to confirm your suspicions. This is all the more frightening when people with immense power and reach spread conspiracies. And when official sources clearly don't tell the truth, that's all the more reason to become skeptical, to start thinking, that's what they want you to think. People in power do lie, and they do have secrets, and sometimes, yes, nefarious schemes. But how rare or far-reaching are such conspiracies? How should we calibrate our skeptics filter of the information we receive? Searching for an answer to that question turned out to be a lot more fun than we expected. For our guide into the land of conspiracy was author John Ronson. Okay, are we rolling? Yeah, John should be on any minute. So what were you saying about which, which book was it? How you came across John Ronson? Oh, gosh. I think my first introduction to John Ronson was when I was in prison. Madison shared with me the psychopath test. He's done a number of noteworthy best-selling books. And the thing that I love about John Ronson is whatever his subject, he always approaches it with a sense of humor and a lot of compassion. Can you talk to me instead of the hypothetical audience? Oh, sure. You want me to tell you, my husband, about why I have a crush on John Ronson? <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> you know, I just, let's be a little more intimate here. Okay. Um, being accused of being a psychopath mm-hmm. and having that splashed across international headlines and then being locked in prison for that. Mm -hmm. And then having your good friend hand you a copy of a book called The Psychopath Test. Right. You know, how did that resonate for you? Like, what was Madison's thinking in getting you that book? And what was it like for you in the midst of going through imprisonment for for psychopathy Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, to discover that book? Obviously, I don't think that Madison was like, hey, here's a book about The Psychopath Test. Maybe you should take it and find out for sure. What I do remember is that when she passed it along to me, it was at a period of my imprisonment where I had already been convicted, so I was in for what I thought was the long haul. 
And I was deeply, deeply interested in asking myself the question, why is this happening to me? And what does this mean for my life? And doing a lot of reading about human psychology and particularly the human impulse to judge. And I found I instantly clicked with John Ronson's approach. One of the big takeaways from the psychopath test is how subjective it is and how, depending on how you ask the question and who and what you're looking for, anyone can like score high on the psychopath test. What I loved from his rendition of it is as he was investigating this issue, he kept finding himself checking the boxes. <laughs> and and at the same time, you know, there are real psychopaths out there and some of them do really, really horrible things. So juggling this issue of judgment and mental health and doing it in a way that talked about confirmation bias and human psychology. And then when you got out. And then when I got out and I was being shamed, then suddenly, yeah. so you've been publicly shamed, came out. Like John Ronson's work has come out as I'm processing things in my life, and he just happens to be processing them in his own investigative journalism yeah. way. And it's really, really helped me process my own experience and feel less alone. Hmm. So I heard that beep. I think John's. I think John's yeah. on. Should we talk to him? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi, John. Hey. <laughs> um, so do you know what you want to talk to us about? I think so, yeah. I, I looked at your email and I was thinking about, you know, adversity and occasions in which I overcame it. And a story did pop into my head. It's a story that I write about a little bit in my very first book, Them, but I can tell you it more fully. It's actually, it feels like an important story in my genesis as a journalist. Awesome. Why is this what's popped into your mind regarding, you know, uh, a maze or a labyrinthine path? Well, for, I think, three reasons. What's about to happen was, is very labyrinthine and it involves adversity. And I uh, vaulted over the adversity like an athlete. And, uh, and <laughs> after, after some initial, whatever the opposite of vaulting is. <laughs> slumping. Uh, yeah, slumping in fear. Um, and this story, which actually sounds really scary, turns out to have been really good for me <laughs> as a writer. So those are the three reasons. Love it. So I'll, I'll tell you that story. Will I start? <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> okay. Well, this happened in 1996. I was kind of just starting out in journalism and I had an idea. Well, the story begins, actually, I was on the roof of a television production company in Brixton in London uh, with a guy called Fenton Bailey, who um, is probably now most famous for RuPaul's Drag Race. Oh, fun. Yeah, so he's like RuPaul's manager and production company and so on. Anyway, so Fenton said to me, like, you should make a TV series about conspiracy theories. And I think what Fenton had in his mind was like, you know, who killed JFK and who killed Princess Diana. That was the kind of... And why you? Were you a conspiracy theory person or was he... No, neither of us were. In fact, you know, if anything, we felt that conspiracy theorists were probably wrong about things. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, but Elaine's just come home. So let me just close the door so she doesn't... Oh, yeah, of course. Okay, hang on. Say one... hello. Oh, Amanda Knox and Chris Robinson are saying hello. <laughs> They're shouting hi back. Okay, hang on one second. I'm just going to close the door. I'm doing an interview. I think she's been like asleep every time I've come to your place. I don't know if I've ever met Elaine in person. Um, I'm not sure if you have ever met Elaine, but she exists. And you probably heard her voice just then. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let's call this the Elaine hoax conspiracy. Does John Ronson's wife actually exist? 
Anyway, <laughs> so Fenton, Fenton said you should do something about conspiracy theorists. And it gave me a brainwave. And the brainwave was that I'd made two previous documentaries, one about an Islamic militant called Omar Bakri Mohammed and the other about a Ku Klux Klan leader. And I'd noticed that what these two people both had in common was that they both believed in the conspiracy theory that there was a shadowy cabal secretly ruling the world from inside a secret room. And they called it the Bilderberg Group. Hmm. And uh, I thought, okay, I'm onto something here. So I thought, well, how can I tell this story? Because a problem with conspiracy theorists, I remember realizing at the time, is that they don't do anything. They just sit there sort of postulating. And, that, and you can't have an adventure with people who just sit there. And I thought, I know I'll connect with some conspiracy theorists and I'll say, okay, let's travel the world trying to find the secret room. Mm -hmm. And when we find it, we'll get in somehow like up the drain pipe, um, <laughs> and confront them going about their covert wickedness. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, whatever happens is going to be kind of interesting. So I discovered quite quickly that there was a, a world expert on the Bilderberg Group, and his name was uh, Big Jim Tucker. <laughs> of course. <laughs> right. Um, he was a former sports reporter. Uh, he looked just like somebody from a Dashiell Hammett novel, like an office with Venetian blinds and a shirt with braces. He, he looked like Sam Spade. The story that he told me was that he discovered the existence of this group called the Bilderberg Group, which meets in secret every year. They meet once a year in a five-star hotel with golfing facilities, and that's where they secretly rule the world from. That's where they plan the wars. <laughs> well, we knew that already. The golf course was clear. <laughs> part of right. it. Right. <laughs> well, I said, golfing facilities. And uh, he said to me, they may play golf when they're there, but they're not there to play golf. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, to go off on a little tangent, that night, that very same night, I went back to my hotel and I tried to phone my wife, Elaine, and I couldn't get her on the phone. Again, that elusive Elaine, very convenient. And I started to panic. I had a panic attack. I was using the hotel phone. I was phoning neighbors, the police, the fire brigade. Oh, no. Yeah, I went into a real paroxysms of panic. Were you worried that it had something to do with the Bilderberg group or what, what was going through your mind? <laughs> <laughs> They're on to you already. <laughs> you know what? I think in my fevered state, that probably did cross my mind. I thought, well, given I haven't actually done anything yet, They'll have to be very good. Very proactive. <laughs> yeah, very proactive. I also thought that, well, what had obviously happened was that Elaine, she was upstairs running for the phone, tripped on the stairs, fell, broke her neck, oh. was lying dead at the bottom of the stairs. And my son, Joel, my baby Joel, had somehow got out of his cot and was reaching for the power cord of a just boiled kettle. <laughs> oh, no. That was the mental picture I had. Oh, <laughs> so is this just new father paranoia or? Well, catastrophizing, just general catastrophizing in the, <laughs> in the midst of a panic attack. Anyway, the reason I remember this so well is because when I checked out of the hotel the next morning, the hotel receptionist, the blood drained from his face when he looked at my bill because my phone bill from that one night's panic attack had come to $900. Wow. <gasps> I thought, wow, that is the monetary value of my panic attack, $900. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Anyway, it's funny. I always remember that as being the night that me and Big Jim Tucker decided to infiltrate the Bilderberg group together because he said to me, you've actually caught me at a good time. I've got a mole inside Bilderberg and his mole, I can tell you this now, it's 20 years later, his mole was an accountant who was also an accountant for members of the Bilderberg group. And he said his mole had told him where they were meeting that year. And it was the Caesar Park Hotel and Golfing Resort in Sintra, Portugal. Hmm. And Jim said he was going to fly over there and get in, like, you know, report on the meeting and get in and somehow try and witness it. Uh, so I said, can I come? And he said, okay. 
Wait, so he automatically trusted you? Like, uh, was he suspicious of you? Did he think that you were part of the Bilderberg group? I think he was He was happy to have some company. And, you know, there's safety in numbers. You know, we were doing something that could be hazardous. Big Jim, he worked for a newspaper that I didn't really know anything about at the time called The Spotlight. It was a niche publication, whereas I was, at the time, you know, making television documentaries and writing for The Guardian. So he felt was, legitimized. I don't know if it was legitimized, but maybe more so like they're not going to hurt a guy from The Guardian, but they might hurt a guy from The Spotlight. Ah. I see. Yeah. yeah, you can make a spotlight crazy person disappear, but a Guardian journalist. Yes. So that's how the story begins. Will, will I, will I, I just stop there in case you wanted to like cut to ads or something. Oh. Right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, very considerate of you. <laughs> We could tell you all the great reasons you should support Labyrinths on Patreon, including ad-free episodes and exclusive patron-only content. But why not hear it direct from a listener? Hi, my name is Allie, and I joined Labyrinths Patreon because there's nowhere else that you can explore the ebbs and the flows of humanity with the kind of truth and grace that you can get with Labyrinths. There really isn't anywhere else you can get that. Visit patreon.com slash Robinson. Okay, so you've teamed up with Big Tucker. Big Jim Tucker. Yes. Yeah. And you hop a plane to Portugal? Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> to uh, Estoril, which is a sort of tourist town close to Sintra, which is the location of the meeting of the shadowy cabal that secretly rules the world, the Bilderberg Group. So, you know, I made a decision not to do any research. It was partly a decision born from laziness, and it was also <laughs> <laughs> a sort of creative decision. I thought, I'm on an adventure. I don't want to look up Jim. I don't want to look up the Spotlight. I don't want to look up the Bilderberg Group. I just want to be a twig in this hmm. river. Interesting. Yeah. I remember making that decision, and as it turns out, it was the very best decision to make because not knowing made the story so much better. So I flew to Portugal, hooked up with Jim. This was the day before the Bilderberg Group was supposed to arrive, according to his mole. So me and Jim decided to go undercover to the hotel just to wander around. Jim said that maybe we would make some contacts with waitresses and chambermaids. So we drove up into the hills of Sintra and found the Caesar Park Hotel, which is this huge pink marble resort with lots of swimming pools. You know, a sort of fancy five-star hotel with golfing facilities. Mm -hmm. And we scouted around, we sat by the pool. I, I think we tried talking to a couple of waitresses and chambermaids, but that didn't go so well. Was it nerve-wracking? Were you nervous? Oh, yeah, totally. I, I don't enjoy doing that kind of thing at all. I, they were suspicious of us because, like, you know, Jim was this sort of Sam Spade guy It is. I suppose 60s, 70s, chain smoker, very unfit. And I was this sort of 30-year-old, you know, we just looked like an incongruous duo, me and Jim. I bet the waitresses and chambermaids could tell that you wanted something, but were confused because it wasn't the thing that people normally want when they have an ulterior motive. Yes, I sensed that there was a tension in the air and there was a little bit of suspicion going on. Like, we were being talked about, was what I sensed. Did you even know if there were fancy, rich people arriving? Is that even confirmed at this point? Nope, nope, absolutely not. You could just have boarded a plane to Portugal and have gone to a hotel for no reason. Totally. Still thinking, I wonder whether this is all Jim's imagination. Like, I had no idea. Also, it looked like the hotel was shutting down. There were still sunbathers by the pool. I think Jim wrote in his notepad, unaware holidaymakers. It sort of felt like 
the last vacationers were on their last day. That's kind of perfect time for the Bilderberg Group to come. <laughs> well, yes. But <laughs> so we wandered around. We spent a couple of hours there sitting by the pool. And then we left. And as we left, we began to get followed by a car. What? Yeah, a dark green Lancia car was following us. And a chase ensued. Now, I say a chase. I was going 30 miles an hour, so was he. But <laughs> if I'd gone faster, he'd have gone faster. <laughs> so a very staying within the speed limit chase ensued <laughs> through the windy cliff roads of Sintra. So did you start to believe? I was all in. <laughs> That's all it took, just that yeah. one green car. <laughs> well, well, I was being tailed. I'd never been tailed before by anyone, not least the henchmen of the secret rulers of the world, uh, which is what I assumed. So I stopped the car, and he stopped the car behind me. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> so by now I knew that I was being followed. So I thought, okay, I'll fix this. So I, I walked over to his car and I sort of tapped on his window to show him my press card. And he wouldn't look at me. Oh, yeah, my God, that is so creepy. <laughs> so creepy. He just stared straight ahead and refused to engage with me. So I got back in the car and started driving again and he started following us again. Uh, no way. Yep. So I phoned the British Embassy and I said, um, hi, I'm calling you on the road from Sintra to Estoril. I'm being tailed right now by a dark green Lancia belonging to the Bilderberg Group. And the woman on the other end of the phone went, <gasps> and then she went, go on. <laughs> <laughs> So I said, I'm sorry, but I just heard you take a sharp breath. And she said, did you have Bilderberg's permission to be in Portugal? Or do you have Bilderberg's <gasps> blessing to be in Portugal? Do they know you're here? She said, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm essentially a humorous journalist out of my depth. <laughs> um, I said, do you think it'll help if you tell him that? <laughs> And I said, also, I'm here with a man called Big Jim Tucker. He's an agent provocateur. That might be the problem. <laughs> I said, maybe you could phone uh, the Bilderberg group and explain that I may be in the car with Jim Tucker, but I'm nothing like Jim Tucker. Like, <laughs> I immediately sold Jim out to save my own skin. Jim, at this point, was just loving it. He wound down the window. He was waving at the Lancia. He was having the time of his life being followed by his the His dreams were coming true. Totally. It was total vindication. He was taunting the guy who was following us. I remember him saying, smile pretty for my camera. He said that at one point. Wow. So she said, well, look, just go back to your hotel, sit tight, and I'll see what I can do, and I'll phone you back. So I phoned Elaine from Portugal. I have to say... I admire John's commitment to the whole Elaine story. It almost sounds real. And I was like, Elaine, things have got very bad. I'm, I'm being chased by the Bilderberg group. I'm really out of my depth. I don't know what's going to happen next. And Elaine interrupted me and said, oh, you're loving it. <laughs> <laughs> and you were like, you know me so well. <laughs> I was freaking out. I, I thought, I'm completely out of my depth. Aww. So I went back to the hotel and the woman from the British Embassy phoned back and said, OK, I've just spoken to the Bilderberg office at the Caesar Park Hotel and they said that nobody's following you and how can they call off somebody who doesn't exist? It's exactly what they would say, isn't uh. it? Right. <laughs> so I said, he's behind the tree. He had got out of his car and was literally standing outside the hotel behind a tree looking at me. <laughs> okay, okay. Was he dressed in a dark suit? Like, what did he look like? 
like he was FBI or something. You know, he had like a dark suit. And was, was he putting his finger to his ear like he had a weird earpiece in? Or is well, that... I don't know, but he's definitely the sort of person who would have done that, whether he actually <laughs> did or not. Okay. What occurs to me, John, here is that you're either a very natural spy yourself or he's a very bad spy. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's very funny you should say that, Chris, because the woman for the British Embassy said to me, the good news is if you know you're being followed, they're probably just trying to intimidate you. And the dangerous ones are the ones that you don't know are following you. (laughs) Yeah, I bet that made you feel better, right? (laughs) Right. I thought, well, what if he is one of the dangerous ones and I just happen to be naturally good at spotting them? So then I um, thought I'm... um, I'm going to the beach. So I I walked down to the beach. Why the beach? I don't know. It just felt safe to be among people. This was a living nightmare, Amanda. Oh. I had no idea, like, how powerful this man was, how powerful this group was, how long this was going to last, if I was in any genuine danger. I wanted to just get in a car and just drive to London. Oh. So I just spent, you know, a couple of hours walking around the beach And then I finally went back to the hotel. And as I walked into the hotel lobby, there were two men in suits sitting in the lobby. And as soon as I walked in, they frantically picked up brochures for the table and started to read them. Wow. It's almost as conspicuous as having like a newspaper in front of them with two eye holes cut through it. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. This is terrifying. By now, Jim was very drunk and just having the greatest night of his life, picking up women in the hotel bar. (laughs) I said to him, I said, there's two guys in the lobby and I'm pretty sure they're following us. And Jim said, how do you know? And I said, you can tell by their demeanor. And then Jim posted an article about what was happening on the Spotlight's website. And at one point in the article, he said, Robson said that there were two men in the lobby following us. I asked him, how do you know? He replied, you can tell by their smell. (laughs) And I said, I said, demeanor. (laughs) And he's like, that's what that means. (laughs) I said, I've never in my life said that anyone could be told by their smell. (laughs) Did it occur to you to walk up to those two guys the way you had to the driver? No, no. By now, I just, I was just fearful. Spooked. Yeah, I was very, very spooked. Very spooked because some of the most powerful people in the world, apparently, were about to land in the Algarve in Portugal, and it wasn't being reported. So it was the day that if this group actually existed, and by now I was strongly suspecting that they did, were supposed to arrive. So we stood at the bottom of the the driveway, me and Jim, and all of a sudden, all of these limousines started pulling up and driving past us. And in these limousines were Henry Kissinger Mm -hmm. drove past us, David Rockefeller. Crazy. uh, Vernon Jordan, who was one of Bill Clinton's biggest advisors, he drove past us. And then all of these captains of industry, like the head of Heinz, drove past us. And Catherine Graham, who owns the Washington Post, she drove past us. And none of this had been reported. This should have been in the papers. No, it was just us standing there, stunned. And that's sort of the end of that story, except for a few things. I've sort of, in a way, kept the best bit till last. That's a good place for an ad break, I think. Back in 1996, John Ronson and Big Jim Tucker were among a tiny handful of people trying to peel back the veil on the secretive Bilderberg Group. Today, when the Bilderberg Group meets, they are regularly met with crowds of conspiracy-minded protesters. If you've got that much secrecy, that much power, that much money, there must be something going on. That's quite a frightening concept where you have a small handful of people controlling the entire world. Many of these people are there because they follow conspiracy spreaders in alternative media. 
I've been listening to Alex Jones on Infowars.com quite a lot and um, I know that they are basically a shadow government and they're trying to rule the world and I just don't agree with it. There are powerful corporate groups above government manipulating things. I mean, if you get the Bilderberg nod like Bill Clinton did in 1991, little known governor, you're going right to the top. Uh, they set a lot of policies. They steer much of our world. Conspiracy theories so often tread in us versus them thinking. Them with a capital T. And perhaps because they rarely operate off solid evidence or data, things like prejudice and stereotype tend to fill the void. And they come to conclusions as ugly as they are absurd. Like when Alex Jones claims that the Jewish mafia rules the world. Such anti-Semitism is far from rare in the conspiracy theory world, as John found out when he finally did some research on Big Jim Tucker and his publication, The Spotlight. So firstly, I discovered that The Spotlight was famously anti-Semitic and sort of neo-Nazi. And they thought Bilderberg was a big Jewish conspiracy, even though... I mean, I know the word Bilderberg sounds Jewish, but the reason why it's called Bilderberg was the very first hotel they met in was called the Bilderberg Hotel Mm -hmm. in the Netherlands. And there's nothing Jewish about the Bilderberg group. Yet, you know, lots of anti-Semites think Bilderberg is evidence of a Jewish conspiracy. Now, did Big Jim know that you were Jewish? I'm not sure. I I certainly never saw any anti-Semitism from Big Jim. But later on, I went to the Spotlight offices and I confronted Jim and his editor about the anti-Semitism, and they got very annoyed, very kind of icy. So, John turned away from the theorists and went straight to the source. After all this was over and I was back in Britain, I started writing to members of the Bilderberg Group to see if anybody would talk to me. And in the end, I actually got three members of the Bilderberg Group to talk to me. One, actually, no, four members. uh, One off the record and three on the record. And the three that were on the record was uh, Dennis Healy, Lord Healy, who was a huge figure in British politics in the 1960s and 1970s. He was the Chancellor of the Exchequer in Britain. So he was in charge of the money and was the second most powerful. And he was left wing. He was a Labour Party uh, member. And I talked to Lord Owen, who's a liberal, who went to the Bilderberg Group. And I talked to Martin Jacobs, who was the head of this big high street sort of newspaper, W.H. Smith. It's like Britain's version of Hudson News. Okay. So I talked to all of them and I got a sense of how the Bilderberg Group saw themselves And the way that Dennis Healy explained it to me was it was set up not long after the Second World War, and they thought, how can we thwart another Hitler, a political ideologue? And the way to do it was to take power away from politicians and put it in the hands of business, because business people aren't ideological, they just care about making money, and that felt safer (laughs) to this group of globalists uh, shortly after the Second World War. But it is the New World Order. It is what the right-wing conspiracy theorists feared. But the Bilderbergers didn't see themselves as a group that should be feared. They thought capitalism is safer than political demagogues. And the idea was to bring along rising politicians. Bill Clinton went before he was president. Margaret Thatcher went before she was prime minister. And get them to meet with industrialists and business leaders and offer these politicians wise words about keeping power in the hands of business. That seemed to be their agenda. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. My feeling, without knowing that much about 1950s politics, is that it probably would have felt like a good idea in the 50s as the world was recovering from the war. But the decades that follow have proved that it was a flawed idea. You don't want to give business leaders too much power. Totally. Yeah. But anyway, the last thing I want to say about this story, once I was out of the adventure and safely back at home, it took me a long while for my paranoia to die down. (laughs) At one point, I noticed that my car had been broken into, but nothing had been taken. And I became convinced that the Bilderberg Group had put a listening device somewhere in my car. Of course. (laughs) Yeah. I remember being self-conscious. I'd also trapped in a lonely hell because I didn't (laughs) want Elaine. 
to think that we were being surveilled by the Bilderberg Group. But as I sat there, I thought, this was a great adventure. I'm going to sit here and it's going to be the best bit of writing I've ever done. And I'm not going to stop until it's perfect. And so I spent the whole summer writing that story up about being chased by the Bilderberg Group. I mean, obviously the whole thing was amazing, but the thing that stayed with me the most is in that moment of paranoia, I got to see the world through Jim Tucker's eyes. And for a journalist to be able to really see the world through the person that they're chronicling is really useful. It's really good. Now, Jim and the Spotlight weren't really people to empathize with. It was a racist newspaper. They were spreading damaging conspiracy theories. But it did give me a skill that I've used ever since. It just taught me to be more empathetic Mm. in a funny way. It taught me to be less solipsistic, to see the world less through my own personal ideology. And I think that's a talent that stayed with me ever since. And I've used it in good ways with my books, Have You Been Publicly Shamed, for instance, where I'm empathizing with people who are much more deserving of that kind of empathy, yet are still you know, attacked by everybody else. Totally. Yeah. I mean, just before you got on, Chris was like, so why is it that you have such a huge crush on John Ronson? <laughs> and I was like, well, because he's doing something that I've been doing ever since I was thrown into a prison cell, and that is trying to understand why by really trying to put myself in the shoes Mm. of this person or that person. Yeah. And you're just way cool and awesome and funny, and I wish I could do what you do. (laughs) Well, I mean, obviously I'm very flattered, (laughs) but, you know, when you talk about trying to understand your prosecutor, to try and see the world the way he saw it is, is, you know, it's a kind of form of radical empathy, and I really admire it in you, Amanda. Oh, thanks, John. What I find um, fascinating about the conspiracy mindset, that this moment where you're achieving empathy for Big Jim Tucker Mm. is also the moment where you become ultimately solipsistic because the conspiracy mindset is one in which everything's about you, right? (laughs) So when you break into your car and you think, oh, God, Bilderberg has bugged me, (laughs) like— What an egoist type thought that this vast, powerful organization cares enough (laughs) to bug you, little John Ronson. (laughs) I mean, I totally hear you, Chris, although, but in fairness, I would say that they were following me. It was, exactly. That's not crazy. It's funny, after my book came out, I gave this talk at a meeting called Skeptics in the Pub. I joined the Q&A. I remember like somebody, one of the skeptics said, so you were metaphorically followed by the Bilderberg group. And I said, there was nothing metaphor. (laughs) (laughs) That guy was behind a tree. (laughs) That was not a metaphor. I was actually followed. Yeah, what Um, what I find fascinating is this notion that the people who grab hold of those conspiracy theories and build worldviews around them, they tend to engage in that kind of solipsism. They find themselves mm. to be more important to the world events than they have any right to consider themselves. Yes. And that seems to be related to this idea that the world is more ordered than chaotic. I think it comforts people to think that, you know, even if I'm not in control of the world, some secret cabal is. <laughs> yeah. And it's a lot scarier to think that no it's one. just a bunch of independent actors struggling against each other. And it really is a lot less ordered than you would hope. Right. Yes, I agree with that. Um, About a year ago, I had another series of panic attacks. And I remember handling them in a very solipsistic way. And I thought, well, of course you're going to be solipsistic if you're having a panic attack. Mm. Because a panic attack feels like being chased through the woods by a bear. Mm. And, you know, you're not going to be thinking about other people in in that circumstance. And so maybe being chased by the Bilderberg group is a little bit like having a panic attack and a bit like being chased through the woods by a bear. And so solipsism... Well, solipsism is never a great thing. There's certain situations where it's an understandable thing. Yeah, so that's my story. Of oh, I told you it would be jam-packed of adversity, a labyrinthineness, and um, triumph over adversity, and that's exactly what I delivered. Thank you. <laughs> the, part where, the part where you vault over the adversity, what was that part again? 
Um, well, the fact that I ended up writing a best-selling book about it. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, plug the book, John. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's true, though. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that book sort of really launched my career. And, and also, it wasn't just the fact that it sold well. It was also the fact that I felt like it, that moment, being chased by the Bilderberg Group, really helped me mature, you know, as a, as a writer. Mm. Okay, well, look, I'll get off, but... That was really interesting. and um, Well, thank you so much, John. You're an amazing storyteller. We love you. Thanks, you guys. Thank you, Chris, as well. And, Thanks, John. Uh, I'll talk to you both soon. All right. Great. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Okay, we're still rolling. What's the minotaur in that maze? The minotaur in his maze? I mean, it sounds like the adversity for him was fear, like he suddenly felt afraid and that he was in an adventure that was way more than he had bargained for. Mm. But ultimately, it was an exhilarating and um, fulfilling experience that has, you know, affected the subjects that he looks into and how he looks into them. I mean, I wonder when his wife says, you're loving it. Mm -hmm. To what degree was John actually loving it? And to what degree was he actually scared? I mean, it sounds like he was genuinely scared. Yeah, I think. You know, the people that he's trying to get close to are some of the most powerful people in the world. And if you believe the conspiracy theorists, the most powerful people in the world. Mm -hmm. And if you really believe that, and I don't think you have to believe the full they control the world thing for it to be true that they are incredibly powerful. Right, they could disappear you. Yeah, Yeah. I mean... Yeah, I mean, that what's... Right? It's not crazy to be like they could disappear you because people get disappeared. Yeah. Like, that's a thing that happens. All right, the cats are, like, begging for attention out there. Join us next time as we sit down with two parents, perhaps not unlike your own, who are stuck in a labyrinth of unending pain and confusion that will stretch the bounds of your empathy. So come on, get lost with us. Find us on Twitter, at Amanda Knox. At Man Under Bridge. At KnoxRobinson.com. And subscribe so you don't miss the next episode of Labyrinths. And while you're at it, give us a five-star rating. Please? This episode was written by us, edited and sound designed by Chandler Mays with theme music by Josh Budo Karp. Hold it right there. Let me hear your ad. These aren't the ads you're looking for. These aren't the ads we're looking for. This podcast is listener-supported. This podcast is listener supported. Visit patreon.com slash Knox Robinson. Come on, boys. Let's visit patreon.com slash Knox Robinson. Ha 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 ha!